rolling along here from the barn with post-draft interviews joining us now. A guy who was very busy Thursday, Friday, and Saturday because he ultimately exercised 15 picks on behalf of the Minnesota Vikings. He is Vikings general manager Rick Spielman. Rick, welcome back to the program. How are you, pal? Good. Glad to have you uh, invited into your private bar. It looks like a very enticing place to come. You, you are invited any time to come for real. I would hand you a beverage through the, through the magic of technology if I could, but we spend a lot of time down here watching football games. Uh, th there may have been a moment down here a few years ago when a certain touchdown catch was made. There may or may not be a photograph of that touchdown catch <laughs> hovering over one of the beams down here in the barn. But uh, let's start there um, because, you know, I, I thought it was coincidental to say the least that you used the Stephon Diggs pick on a receiver. And it reminded me of what the Vikings did a year before you got there in 2005. The pick they got from the Raiders became Troy Williamson, a top 10 pick in the 2005 draft. Did you at any point stop and think, maybe I shouldn't use the Stephon Diggs pick on a receiver? Was there, is there any like sense of jinx or the guy's going to have too much to live up to? Is there any of that that goes through your mind at that moment? No, I wasn't here in 2005, but we were following our board and uh, he was the highest player on our board at the time. Uh, it happened to fill a need, and we think he's an excellent football player. Um, he fits well within the scheme that we're going to run, uh, excellent route runner. And the biggest thing, what we saw was that as the season progressed and when the bright lights came on through the playoffs, his game went to another level, and that rise continued as we went through the combine and all the pre-draft processes that we do. So we were very excited he was there at the 22nd pick. But still, isn't it and, – and look, I understand it's a crapshoot. And for every Laquan Treadwell, there's an Adam Thielen. But do you personally have concern about what that first-round draft pick pedigree possibly can do to a receiver? It almost seems like they develop better if they don't have that hanging around them, almost like a ball and chain when they come into the NFL. I, yeah, I don't look at that uh, that way whatsoever. All we're doing is I know the time and effort we put into all the evaluations from the scouts, from our coaches, uh, layering in the analytics process that we do, and felt very confident this is going to be a, a very productive uh, receiver for us. Is the hope that Justin Jefferson jumps right in as a starter, the starter across from Adam Thielen? Right now, we're just, I'm trying to get the best 90 players possible into uh, camp uh, when we're able to get back into camp. And then I know the coaches are very excited about getting their hands on these players, um, getting these young guys developed, because a lot of these guys are going to be contributors for us this year, especially with some of the roster turnover that we had. Um, but from his maturity level, uh, everything from his intelligence level, his, the high character that he has and what he's shown on the field. Uh, we're very excited about uh, whatever role he carves out for himself will be a productive Minnesota Viking receiver. How big of a gap was there between him and whoever your next receiver was? And I ask that because there were so many receivers in this draft. Some people would look at it and say, you don't need to use pick number 22 on a wide out. You could get a guy in round two. You could get a guy later in round one, pick number 31 if you would stay there. You could get a guy in round three. How big of a gap was there between Justin Jefferson and whoever you had next? Well, Mike, I was going to invite you to look at our draft board so you can answer that. But, you know, <laughs> fortunately, we're all stay at home. So that, won't be, that wasn't being able to be accomplished this year. But I can just tell you that we felt very strongly about getting that, uh, getting Justin in here and where we drafted him. And as we looked at our draft board, uh, I know a couple of the corners went off and then uh, we were able to trade down at our 25th pick and still get a corner that we coveted as well. So a lot of times when you're following your draft board, you're looking at the depth. Um, there, are, there is depth at receiver, but we felt there was depth at corner too. There were a couple guys we eyed there, um, but we were very fortunate to get both guys that we really targeted and were hoping to get. Yeah, you traded down from... 
25 to 31 and got a cornerback there. I saw a report, a suggestion, whatever, that the Packers tried to do that deal with you guys from 30 to 25. D d d is that true that there was a conversation there? I'm sure any Vikings fan would get slightly concerned to hear about a possible trade with the Packers. I, 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 we do so many phone calls and we've been very active on the trade. To be honest with you, I can't remember, <laughs> you know, who we talked to and didn't talk to. I know, you know, when the 49ers wanted to come up and, and uh, we felt it was a good deal for us to move back, still be able to get the player that we wanted and pick up and accumulate some of the extra picks that we were hoping to get during the draft. Once it all started happening, the phone started ringing, the picks started being made, Rick. How different was the at-home experience for you than the normal experience in the Vikings draft room at the facility? I think, you know, from how the, the incredible job that our IT department did, I thought the NFL did an incredible job on their end and how they had everything set up from the IT and the football operations standpoint. And we had meetings for over, for about a month uh, and I think at the beginning of the meetings, it was a little awkward, like doing these interviews, but now they're, you know, second nature because that's how we're doing interviews uh, in today and where we're at. Um, but once we got on the draft board, we have been rehearsed at so many times, been through so many meetings that it was second nature and felt very comfortable. I think everybody uh, as we went through the process. I want to go back to Stephon Diggs because we had a little fun with you at the scouting combine right before the world turned upside down, asked to look into the camera and say, we have no intent to trade Stephon Diggs. And you said, Stephon Diggs is a Minnesota Viking. I mean, wh when did it actually get to the point with Diggs where you knew that this is a relationship that had to end, that this is a guy that needed to be traded? It wasn't fixable to keep him in Minnesota. I, you know, we weren't looking to trade Stefan at all. I know we just had signed him under a contract. He's a young, explosive playmaker, um, has had a lot of great years uh, that he's been here. I mean, we drafted him in the fifth round and has developed into one of the top receivers. But you don't know when opportunities come your way, and we felt that it was a great deal um, for Buffalo to get a player of that caliber, and we felt we got – in exchange, the fair amount of draft picks we would have looked for if we were going to trade him, and it ended up happening that we did trade him. Was it a factor at all for you to get him out of the conference so you don't have to see him on a regular basis? Does that come into the thinking at all when you're evaluating the offers? Well, I don't know if we would have traded him to Green Bay or Detroit or Chicago, if that's what you're asking, but it does help when you can get him into a different conference than uh, us potentially playing against him. Before you make that deal, do you talk to any of the guys on the team? Do you talk to Kirk? Do you talk to Adam Thielen? Do you get their temperature on whether or not this makes sense? Or is it something that, you know, there's a firewall there. The players play, coaches coach, administrators administer, and we're going to make the moves that we make without getting anyone's input who's actually on the field with it. No, any roster move we make, any draft pick we make, uh, that's all done from the uh, football ops standpoint. I mean, it's me communicating with the coaches. It's me communicating with the scouts. And more, more importantly, it's me communicating with our ownership so they understand what's going on. But I don't think, uh, and I, I don't want to put words into other teams' mouth, but most of the time when you're going to make roster transactions whether it's a trade or a draft or signing someone in free agency you may get some background from some of the players that know him but for the most part we're doing our job you had some comments yesterday about running back dalvin cook a second round pick a few years back who has blossomed into one of the best running backs in the nfl and you echoed something that we have noticed in the way that the vikings have handled their roster Young players who develop there get rewarded there for the most part, and your goal is to reward Dalvin Cook the way you have rewarded many others before him. How do you balance that against the possibility of giving him a contract? And I don't need to name names or teams. We all know by this point the teams and the players that fall into this category, the running back position, but balancing that against a contract you're going to regret within a year or two. How do you how do you make those two things work? You take care of him, but you also don't have a deal where you're like, God, why in the hell did we do this? Well, I think, you know, those are all our internal discussions. I mean, uh, talking with the coaching staff, talking, you know, we tie in Rob Brzezinski and how 
and if we can make a contract work um, from a financial standpoint to fit within the cap, but not only this year, within the years to come. That's why we always try to cap plan two or three years out now that we have a new CBA. Um, so we, we weigh all those factors in as we make these decisions, but we also know that you know, we, we believe in playing our, paying our own players. Um, those are the guys that we develop. We know them the best. We know what they are from a work ethic standpoint. We know what type of players they are. But we also know how much they mean out to our community and how involved they are. And, and Dalvin checks all those boxes. He's a, he's, a, he's a very good football player, but he's even a better human being. So we take the whole picture in. And like I said, our philosophy and history has been – develop and hopefully we're drafting well enough and we have to, to give long-term extensions to the guys that have come in and helped us win ball games and then fit everything that we're looking for to build our culture. You know, it's funny. I remember when he was drafted Rick, back in 2017, there was this vague sense of off-field concerns. It contributed to him sliding out of round one. There's never been a peep. There's never been an issue. He's been nothing but a model citizen in three NFL seasons. There'd be plenty of things he could have been frustrated about and acted out about with the injury issues. No, he's been off the charts, you know, and those are things that are, that you do a lot of background work on. We've always have done that. I remember the call I made to him that uh, Friday morning before we drafted him and moved up to go get him and how impressive he was. And just me and him talking one-on-one -on -one, uh, before the draft started that day. And, uh, you know, just talking to some of the sources that I know that have been around him we felt very confident in taking him, not because he was a great player, but because what he stood for uh, as a human being. And all those things and all the resources and all the research that we've done on him came true. And he's one of the leaders in the community. He's always out in front. He's always contributing uh, to, in different ways. I know, um, you know, I just did another thing with COVID-19 and, and how he's sacrificing some of his monies so he's, that just tells you what kind of character and person that we did enough research on to feel very confident that that's what he was going to turn out to be, and that's what he was and has been. You, you mentioned the COVID-19 pandemic, and you said a couple of minutes ago that you look at salary cap planning several years into the future. When we consider what may happen later this year, there may be a season with no fans in the stands, and there would be a dramatic hit to the revenue as a result of that. How do you plan for a salary cap in 2021 when the revenues in 2020 could dramatically affect what is available to you for spending purposes next year? Yeah, it's hard to, to do. Right now, we are um, just, we planned as everything was going to be normal. Uh, we don't know where everything's going to be uh, when that time comes. I don't know where the salary cap will be if all the revenue cap doesn't come in. So you try to do your best. You try to understand potentially what can happen, but it's just hard to predict. It was even like getting through this draft where we're going to be able to get in our building and then that change, where we're going to do something from an, a remote location and that change. And then we adapted and we were able to uh, function from each other, you know, our individual homes, which turned out great. So Part of this job is being flexible and being able to adjust and move and come up with uh, different ways to look at things, especially when you can't control the adversity that may be ahead. What kind of information are you currently getting from the league office as to what is to come, whether it's getting any of the off-season program in, getting training camp started on time, getting the season started on time? Are you getting any guidance or are you in the same situation the rest of us are? We're just sitting and waiting. We're just right now worried about what we can control today. And what we can control today is what we're doing in our virtual off-season program, which kicked off this week and has been, uh, been very successful. Uh, we got a virtual rookie mini camp coming up next weekend. So all we can do now is control what we can control and uh, make sure we're doing the best we can in those circumstances. And then we'll keep adjusting as things keep changing. But at thing. It seems like things change almost on a daily basis. So what you can worry about is control what you can control, and that's all you, you need to worry about. And you're not doing virtual workouts. You're just doing the virtual off-season meetings. What went into the decision to not have a workout component for the guys who are at home? 
Well, we, 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 we've done what we've done. Like if we were in the um, with, with a dark, the dark period, um, you know, our players can call our strength coach to ask for advice, but we're not actually coaching them out there. We felt the most beneficial thing for us to do is hone in and make sure we're working on the classroom work right now. Isn't it going to be, though, a, a supreme challenge? And you were there in 2011 when there was no offseason program. Coach Zimmer was in Cincinnati, I think, at the time. But how do you get all these guys ready? How do you make good decisions about who makes the team, who doesn't make the team, if we're talking about training camp and training camp only, maybe not a full preseason, maybe no preseason games, who knows, whatever it is that is still to be determined, it's going to be difficult from my perspective to figure out what you do with these 15 draft picks and your undrafted players. They're going to have limited opportunities, as best I can tell, to prove that they belong. Well, once we get them back in the building and whenever that is, I know Coach Zim, the staff, has actually put in a lot of plans in place on how do we get these guys developed as quickly as we can. And no one knows what the rules are going to be going forward. Um, do we have an acclimation period first to get them adjusted and then get into training camp? Uh, but there's so many unknowns, but we have to be prepared, just like I'm sure every other team is, is once we get our hands, especially on these young guys, what is going to be the program to accelerate these guys developing? And I know our coaching staff has already uh, talked through that. Now, I know what we can control is how much time we can spend in the classroom with them, making sure that they uh, – understand and start to get the playbook down so when they do come in hopefully we'll be off and running from that standpoint and I talked to each one of our draft picks over the last three days doing virtual meetings individually with them telling them how important it is for now to stay in shape um, but to get down this offense get down the defensive scheme the special teams and what you're going to be asked to do when you come in and then when you get in um, just be ready to go and that's that's the only thing we can do right now. Everson Griffin's still floating around out there in free agency. Is the door still open for him to potentially return? Uh, I, you know, it's, it's hard to say right now where everything is at and where we're at, uh, uh, you know, until, you know, things become more normalized. You know, I'll, I'll never say never on a player. Uh, I know it'd be very hard from a, a salary cap standpoint. Uh, it, you know, I don't want to get into any of the business side of it, but um you know, right now I know where our roster is, but, you know, your roster never is set, even with guys getting cut. Uh, guys did not get, uh, you know, are now not tendered as uh, unrestricted free agents, um, guys that are on the street. So I know our pro department and uh, George Payton and them, we're working through, you know, guys on how we can continue to build this roster. So in general terms, you know, we're trying to conduct business as normal as we can. I'm trying to bring guys in here that could potentially help us. One thing you have in common with the Green Bay Packers, both team seasons ended against the 49ers in Santa Clara in the postseason. And based upon what the Packers have done in the offseason, and specifically in the draft, I get the sense that their approach is if you can't beat them, join them when it relates to that power running game that can dominate a defense, control the clock, score points, win game. That's the Packers' plan to get to the next level. What is and what would you say your plan is to try to take the current Vikings roster and get past a team like the 49ers, get past the Packers, get to the Super Bowl? You know, that's what our coaches did all this offseason is went back and self-scout, self-evaluate. How do we tweak our systems here or there? I think the one benefit we have, and especially with our quarterback, is he's going to be in the same system for the second year in a row. And we do have a lot of really good weapons on the offensive side, still with Adam Thielen, with our tight ends, uh, and Irv Smith, who I think is going to be an outstanding player. Uh, we have the running backs. We were able to get Ezra Cleveland into the fold here on our offensive line, and we feel we have some really good young offensive linemen. And some of the guys we drafted last year uh, that maybe didn't get a chance but are going to have to step up and compete. And then to add a Jefferson, uh, we do – think we have a lot of weapons and then Kubiak taking over as the full-time offensive coordinator and some of the wrinkles he's going to put into the system as well so it's great to have such an experienced staff like that um, to go ahead and, and tweak some things to hopefully get us to the next level you know <clears throat> I know on the defensive side of the ball we've had a lot of turnover from a personnel standpoint 
but uh, and a lot of our guys that we did draft were on the defensive side as well, and there's going to be a lot of new secondary and some new defensive linemen. But if you look at the core of our defense, we still have two very good safeties under contract. We franchise Anthony Harris. I think we have two of the best linebacker tandems in the league with Anthony Barr and Eric Kendricks. Uh, Daniel Hunter, uh, we know we were able to sign Mike Pierce when uh, Linville Joseph went on uh, to replace him. So we think we have a lot of core pieces in place. And with the addition of these young guys, as we kind of evolve that defensive side a little bit, that we're going to have a great year coming up. And I almost feel like, Rick, the defense needed a kick in the ass. That it had been that same group for so long that maybe there was a sense of complacency. I don't know. That may not be fair. But from an outsider's perspective, it just kind of felt like the defense got to a level and then was just kind of maybe treading water. And when you bring in fresh young talent, when you bring in new mindsets like Don Capers being involved in the coaching staff, a guy who has a 3-4 background. I just feel like one of the things that Coach Zimmer's trying to do is, is really really put his shoe in the rear end of the defense and shake things up and, and get it back to where it was not that long ago. Yeah, we were very fortunate. I think for six years we almost had the same defensive group all together, which is an eternity in the NFL. Um, but eventually those old guys get older and you have some contract issues and some business decisions that you have to make. So I know, you know, with the challenges of head on, on some of the turnover on the personnel side, especially on the defense, I know how excited coach Zimmer is, uh, you know, some of the new additions because we had some turnover on a defensive staff as well, uh, with two new co-coordinators with Don Capers, uh, Durante Jones coming in as our DB coach, uh, there's a whole new sense of urgency and there's going to be a lot of new faces and it does give you that, that energy um, and, and people are chopping at the bit to uh, get going. Hey, last one before I let you go. I saw recently that Percy Harvin wants to make a comeback. Can you say we have no intent to sign Percy Harvin? We have no intent to sign Percy Harvin. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Perfect. Congratulations on a very busy and hectic draft, and uh, we wish you all the best as the offseason goes forward, and we all hope and pray that there will be a season that gets started in Minnesota and elsewhere throughout the league. Thanks for some of your time. We'll talk soon. Yeah, no, my new uh, lifetime checklist is to come down to that bar and have a cold beverage with you someday. Anytime, <laughs> anytime. Morgantown's a half hour away. The next time you're scouting West Virginia University, swing by and uh, we'll have a few drinks, and then you won't be able to – you won't be able to drive back. We'll have to get you a driver. <laughs> Looks like the palatial palace you live in. There's another spare bedroom somewhere I can sleep. We, we, can, we can find something. We, we, got, we got some pots floating around. We'll take care of it. We have tents. All right. All thanks. Right. thanks, Rick. See you, buddy. Bye. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.